Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you believe that he is a way maker? Amen. He's a miracle worker. We are living proof of his grace and his mercy. Why don't you just thank him right where you're at. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, you are wonderful. We love you, Jesus, and we magnify you. But we welcome all of our friends and family, Morning Star, those who are catching online for the first time. We welcome you. We we invite you to draw a deeper relationship with the Lord. He is so wonderful. It is our created purpose to praise Him and to magnify Him. Amen. I'm so thankful for the Word of God that has changed my life. I'm so thankful for the Word that has taught me how to live in this life and how to move forward. And for every question I've ever had, the Word of God has given us a beautiful answer. And we're so excited for what God has in store for this us this afternoon and how He is going to speak to us through the Word of God. Amen. I'm going to ask that you would open in your Bibles to Genesis 50, chapter 50, and verse 20. It'll be one passage today, Genesis 50 and 20. We do want to thank and give honor for the pastoral staff and bishop, first lady, and Lady Anna, thanking God for awesome leadership in these last days and giving us direction and what he has called his people to do. Amen. I'm going to assume that you have found your place, and if not, we have such a wonderful staff of technicians here that are going to give you the scriptures online. And I do want to thank God for all the technical staff, for the musicians, for the singers, all the help in the house today that is allowing this service to be online when we are at home. We're so thankful for everybody. The scripture reads, but as for you, Hmm. As for you, you thought evil against me, Hmm. but God meant it unto good to bring to pass that it is is this day to save much people alive. Joseph told his brothers, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Let us pray. Father, this is your day. And we're thankful that we have come together to celebrate your love, grace, and mercy upon us. And as much as we miss our brothers and sisters in the house of God, we miss you and are desiring your return now more than ever before. We pray for strength, healing, and encouragement. And 100-fold blessing and restoration in your wonderful and precious name. The name above every name, Jesus Everybody say amen, amen, amen. If you are standing in reverence to the word of God, we encourage you to have a seat. And we thank you for respecting the word of God. It is so precious, especially in these last days. The title that the Lord has given me this afternoon is, and this is the word that the Lord put in my spirit, don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. I believe many of us are carrying some things that we were never intended to carry. There may be a weight in your life. There may be something that is putting a pressure in your life that God never intended to be the case. And I want to declare this to you, maybe remind you, that you didn't create the world. You weren't the creator of it. So the world should not be carried on your shoulders. Like the Greek mythological god Atlas, who was punished into carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, sometimes this is how we feel. I don't know if you've ever been 
in that place in your life or possibly today where you are carrying a weight that is almost unbearable. Well, the good news is that the Lord has a word for you. Maybe you are in a good place today. Maybe you need to store this word for the future. But there are moments and times in our life when the weight of the world becomes so challenging and heavy, causing us to stumble, causing us to fall. But let me tell you this, the only thing the Lord expects us to carry is not the weight of the world, but the cross. The only thing he expects us to carry is the cross. Many times we replace the cross with the world. Luke 9 and 23 tells us, and he said unto them, all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 11 and 30 tells us, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. All you have to carry is a cross that God has asked you to bear that is light it is easy. It's not something that should have you broken in your spirit. It's not something that should take your joy away. It's not something that should take your song away. But the children of God in these last days through every adverse situation have a right and a responsibility to lift up the name of Jesus in the darkest of your moments. You may be struggling in the midnight hour, but I'm here to tell somebody, let that way fall off uh, and pick up the cross. It's not that heavy. It's not that difficult. It's going to allow you to go through hell and high water. But somebody needs to lift up the name of Jesus in these last days. As you lift up the name of Jesus, the weight of the world will fall off your shoulders. As you take up your cross daily and you deny yourself and you say, it's not going to be about me. It's not going to be about my problems. It's not going to be about my pain. It's not going to be about the fears round about me. It's not about anxiety. But, Lord, it's about you. And somehow I've got to find you in the midst of what's happening in my life. Can somebody say amen? Mm. My God is a good God. And because it's not just an adult audience, but we have children that are watching as well, I'm going to take a couple minutes and I'm going to talk about the life of Joseph and and I'm going to take you back to Sunday school if you will for around here we have Wednesday school or Wednesday evening uh, children class about Joseph's life the Bible says that he was his father's favorite but in being his father's favorite he caused a jealousy that maliciously rose up Joseph had two dreams that God had given him, one of sheaves of wheat and the stars of heaven. And they all bowed down and gave reverence to Joseph. They represented his family. So there was a spotlight that ended being, being ended up placed on Joseph's life. And because he was the father's favorite, because uh, he was his father's son of old age and of his favorite wife, uh, his brothers had a problem with the favor that was in his life and also with the dreams that he shared with them. Because of that, they removed his coat of many colors. They sold him down into Egypt. And as he was down in Egypt, he was in Potiphar's house. And in Potiphar's house, God began to bless Potiphar's house. Everywhere that Joseph went, there was a blessing that would follow him. But with the blessing and with destiny and purpose that was in his life, there was also a good amount of challenges and afflictions that were associated Joseph was falsely accused of raping Potiphar's wife, and because of it, he was thrown into prison. 
And even in the prison house, he found favor. And even in that place, he was put in leadership. In Potiphar's house, he was second in command. In prison, he was put in a leadership position again. And in his incarceration, he interpreted a dream of a butler and of a baker. And as time went on, Pharaoh had a dream that only Joseph could interpret. And one of those who was in prison with Joseph and one that remembered that Joseph could interpret dreams reminds Pharaoh that there's one in prison that I forgot all about. He knows how to interpret dreams. He is connected to a God who understands these things. And the Lord used the interpretation of the dream as Joseph came before Pharaoh. God used it. And, and Joseph began to interpret and to understand what the dream meant. And he understood that it was forecasting seasons of plenty and seasons of famine. This brings us to the point and to the passage that we read where because of the famine, Joseph's family ended up coming to him not knowing who he was. And like the dream, they were bowing down to him. And they needed food that he had in store because God had previously given him directions on how to handle this season. I'm talking about Joseph's life going through the outline. And we see that in Genesis 37 and 34, the Bible tells us that there was a favor in his life that was tied to a reason that excluded the other brothers. The father's favor raised up a jealousy against Joseph. And I'm talking about it because I want you to understand what God has given us in these last hours. But just as Joseph had a coat or a garment that signaled favor... We've been clothed with the Father's righteousness, and that causes an indignation uh, to the carnal ones that are round about us. Have you ever felt like the target of one's angst? You may have to ask yourself, is it because I'm favored? Is it because I'm robed with righteousness? If that's the reason, then you are encouraged through the scriptures to rejoice. First Peter 4 and 12 Tells us, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trier, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But the scripture says to rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. I want you to understand that favor is the enemy's focus. What you're going through right now could be because you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. What you're going through right now could be because you've got faith in your life. There's a favor. There's a destiny. There is promise in your life. You may even be stricken your body. Why? Because the enemy knows that there's destiny and purpose in your life. You may be knocked down, but you're knocked out, not knocked out. And I'm thankful for the faith favor that is in our lives. I'm here to thank God for the favor of protection that he's allowed us to go through our challenging trials. He's touched us in our minds and in our spirits. Our God has blessed us. Thank him for the favor that is upon you. That favor is going to get you through every challenge. That favor is going to get you through every problem that may be in your life. There is a favor that attracts the enemy. My God, my God, favor is the enemy's focus, and praise of God should be ours. The enemy sees you as one that is going to inherit great things. Uh, that's his focus. I, I, I got to take this Joseph, rip his coat off, uh, throw him in a pit, uh, sell him down by the way. But God has intended something else. Uh, our focus shouldn't be what they've done, but our focus is what is he going to do for me? What is he going to do to me? What has he done already? There are miracles in my life. Mm. 
that I'm excited for. Can somebody just give him a praise right now? Thank you, Jesus. I didn't think that there'd be much fire in this message, but there's a little fire that's burning in my spirit. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. Right now, I'm just going to have to envision this house full. I have to just look into your room right now, and we're just going to have to give them praise for a little bit and say, I'm thankful for every moment that I've been able to praise God through every season of test, through every trial in my life, come hell or high water, I've been able to praise Him, and I'm going to praise Him right now. I'm going to praise Him through sickness. I'm going to praise him through worry. I'm going to praise him through anxiety. I'm going to praise him through pain. I'm going to praise him through all that is happening in my life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Today's titles don't take it personal. But allow me to lay a quick foundation for this thought. Whether it is your children your house or possessions, when you receive something of value, you take ownership of it. In order to gain something, you have to give something. Sacrifice is essential for the things that are special. This is the place where you make it personal with family relationships and with special possessions. The title today says, don't take it personal, but there are some things that you are going to have to take ownership of. You see, Joseph took personal ownership of the dream God gave him. He shared it with his family. He didn't know that they would look at him in that way. And if we don't finish his story, it doesn't seem fair and it doesn't seem right what Joseph went through. The things that he had to endure, the challenges, the problems, the accusations, they forgot about him, tried to murder him, his own brothers. He had to be obedient and take possession of the dreams and let the other things go. You really can't let something go on until you've taken full ownership of it. We need a discernment of what to carry, what to take ownership, and what to let go. When God gives us an expectation, it is to be personalized and carried out. I can remember when my children were born and see them first coming into the world. And there is no greater feeling than to see your children and know that you're going to spend the rest of your life giving them whatever you possibly can to provide for them, to protect them. But you take ownership. You make it personal that my kids are going to have a better opportunity than I did. Whatever was lacking in my life, I don't want to be a slouch and let that continue on in their life. But I want my children to be raised up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. I want to train them up in the ways of the Lord. I want them to be blessed. I, I, I want there to be that joy and peace in their life. And as a parent, Parent, we take it personal. Mamas, you know when somebody messes with your babies, what you do. I know we got some mama bears out there. Can some mama bears say amen? Because that's your baby. You can't mess with your child. You can't mess with your son or with your daughter. Why? It's because you've taken care of that child personal. You've taken ownership. That's my blood. That's my child. Carry our family's name. So as we're talking about not making it personal, we still have to understand that there are some things that we are going to take personal. But sometimes we have to understand in the times that we take some things personal, we can't take everything personal. The care that you place on your child can't be the same type of ownership that you place on a negative word that has come against you. And if you take this negativity or this, this stuff that's trying to mess with your life and you make it personal and you allow it to get into your spirit, 
then you'll never make your destination in Christ. You'll never get to where God has intended you to be. The problem with personalizing ownership is we don't know where to draw the line. Sometimes, you know, mothers, you're wonderful mothers, and you take care of your kids, and you do everything to prevent them from being sick or, 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 or from making mistakes or being in harm's way. But on the same token, that concern, that ownership that you take and, and making it personal over your children can also drive you to a place of fear and torment and anxiety if you don't balance it out with the Word of God. The same thing with a father or a husband that focuses on providing for his family and working hard and raising finances and being a protector of his house. And if he obsesses over these things, although he should take ownership of it, there has to be a balance that he can't allow, you know, losing his job to cause him to lose his family or to lose his faith in God. Why? Because there has to be a balance and we have to have a discernment on what to take personal and what to let go. The reason we get offended, hurt, even angry is because we invested, we gave, we sacrificed, we donated, we cared for others who didn't return it for good. Have you ever been there? We get too heavily vested in a relationship or a responsibility. And when things go south, we take it personal. Why don't they like me? Why did things turn out the way they have turned out? Well, there's a purpose and there's a plan in your life that God has ordained. Have you ever taken personal ownership of something or someone and it bit you on the backside to the point where there was nothing to sit on? <laughs> Can we get an amen or a yes out there? Or a oh, my. And, you know, it's always the ones that you just give the most to, the ones that seem to cause the most problems. Can we get an Amen. But we have to go through these things. We have to have these relationships. We have to invest into certain things that fall apart. And, 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 and now we're hurt and we're angry and we're, we're torn up about what's happened in our life. But the word of God simply is telling somebody right now, I'm sorry if there's been failure. I'm sorry if there's been meanness round about you. You can't take that personal but you've got to give it to God and say God I don't know how to deal with these emotions and these feelings but God help me in the midst of this situation our opening passage tells us that Joseph as he's there looking at his brothers I'm sure that he thought about it for a minute I'm sure he was hurt in his spirit because he remembered all the evil that they had done unto him. He, I'm sure, remembered his father's face in the land that he missed. And I'm sure there was a lot of things running through his mind at the time. And what he did tell them was, you thought evil against me. He was honest. He made a declaration you meant to hurt me. You meant to destroy me. You meant to kill me. You meant to pull me from my family. You meant to pull me from the favor that was in my life. You, you messed up my life as a young, tried to mess up my life as a young person. And, and the, in the innocency of my life and in my youth, the most sensitive time of my life, you robbed me of a normal childhood. You meant it to destroy me. You meant it to hurt me. But as the enemy was working through those around him, meant him harm, the Lord was working good in him. Evil was round about him, but there was a good that was on the inside. The scripture says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You meant it for evil, and although you threw me in a pit and you sold me down the river, yet 
God was working something on the inside. And even though I was young at that time and I couldn't fight back and, and, and I couldn't defend myself, but now I've come to a place in my life where I'm second in command. You can't touch me now. And I've seen God work through me. But I realize that in this moment you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You try to destroy me. Uh, you try to weaken me but all it did was make me stronger so today I'm standing by the grace of God there's a new song in my spirit there's a spring in my step there's a joy in my face why because my God saw us through he is going to see us through this test the devil mends it for evil but God meant it for good the devil tried to break us up the devil tried to destroy us the devil tried to kill us on the hospital bed but we're gonna declare healing strength victory and when we get back to the house of God we're gonna give him a praise that we've never given him before full strength hundredfold blessing why because they meant it for evil but God meant it for good can somebody simply clap their hands right now thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus here's the point that we really need to make this afternoon when we can see God in it it changes the narrative when we trust that the worst that has happened to us has been allowed by God, then we realize its effect has been eradicated and God will be glorified. In other words, you meant it personally to hurt me. But what Joseph learned how to do was when every attack would come when every time that he was forgotten about or or going through something he saw past the person he saw past the weapon he saw past the murderous spirit he saw past the hate and he saw God he said I'm not gonna make it personal try to knock me down try to knock me out but there's something greater God gave me not just one dream but God gave me two dreams and he had has confirmed that everything is going to be all right and there's a spotlight on my life I said there's a spotlight on my life because of his righteousness and because of that righteousness one day I'm going to have to help you up one day I'm going to have to forgive you one day I'm going to have to help you after you've came against my life why because he didn't take it personal my God you meant to destroy me. You meant to kill my praise. You meant to keep me out of the house of God. You try to ruin my character and my name by false accusations. But I can see past it. God turned the weapon that was formed. The weapon that was aimed in, and it was flung in my direction to not prosper. It can't prosper because when God sets something into motion and when you abide in obedience according to his plan, whatever is meant for evil against you cannot prosper. It cannot prosper. It cannot prosper. In closing, on the cross, Jesus didn't take it personal. His own creation that he breathed life into was crucifying him, was spitting on him, was mutilating him, whipping him, nailed him to a wooden cross. But he didn't take it personal. He didn't look at them and say, I'm going to get you back right now. But he realized that the world needed a savior. 
he realized that somebody needed to stand in the gap for what Adam had done in the garden and to reverse the curse. He knew that somebody needed to go through pain and affliction and to lay his life down so that other people could be free. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know really what they're doing. He didn't take it personal. I believe it was the deacon Stephen that was stoned where Apostle Paul was looking on in an unconverted state. And he said, lay this not to his charge. Forgive these people that are here. And had it not been for that kind of spirit, maybe the Apostle Paul wouldn't have had the opportunity. But there needs to be people in these last days that know how to go through these trials and tribulations and not make it about them. I know your mama and daddy abandoned you. I know that you've been abused and you've gone through all kinds of things when you were younger. And it's messed with your life. I understand that. But you're going to have to get to a place in your life where you realize even though I've gone through trial after trial and blow after blow and sickness after sickness. I can't let this get in my spirit. And I can't take the evil personal. I can't take it personal. You see, what Joseph did was he redirected it to God. There's been so many times in my life where I have taken it personal. Just as much as I take personal ownership of my kids and my family and the responsibilities I have, I'll go over, above and over sometimes just because of my nature and the way I'm wired. And I love to sow and to work into things. And I love to take ownership. You give me a responsibility, and typically I'll do whatever I can to knock it out. But then there are moments on the flip side where I take things just too personal. i got to be honest with you. Because there's an intensity in my life. God had to speak to my spirit and tell me there's times to take certain things personal. Take the dreams of God personal. Take the obligations of God personal. Take the word of God personal. Walk it out. Live it. But the evil that has come against you, you can't take that personal. Even your own personal failures, you can't take it personal. You got to let it go. Lord, I failed you. I stepped the wrong way. I said the wrong thing. I've Done it wrong, Father. But I can't allow this to to determine my life. I can't allow my failures to determine my life. Joseph was standing over his brothers. He could have thrown them in prison and allowed them to go through 13 years of hell like he went through. He could have taught them a physical lesson, took them out in the yard and gave it to them. He could have paid them back. For all that he had gone through. But when he saw them, he made the one of the most beautiful declarations in the scriptures. He was honest. He didn't sugarcoat it. He said, you meant to destroy me. But I was able to see God through it. When God gave me those dreams, they were the impetus for my future. And somehow... As I was sold down into Egypt, as I was falsely accused, as I was thrown in prison, and everywhere I went, I just held on to the God of my dreams. And as I held on to the God of my dreams, he allowed me to not take it personal. He allowed me to not be offended to the point where... He could forgive those who came against him. I know right now that everything that's happening in our lives, it's just a compound of everything that's ever come against us. And when you're sick in your body, it magnifies everything. And right now, it's one blow after another. But God wants you to understand, don't take the sickness that you're going through personal. The sickness that's in your family, you can't take it personal. What's happening in our life, you can't take it personal. But you just got to make it spiritual. And you got to see God in it. 
Lord, I want to see you through this family crisis. I want to see, I want to see you even through my own failures. I want to see you being obedient to God and enduring the afflictions brought about a salvation for an entire young nation. He said, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. So what you're going through is not just for you, it's not about you, it's not to be made personal, but people are going to be saved because you could endure hardness as a good soldier, because you can go through manifold temptations, the fiery trials of life, and still praise God, still trust in God, still love God, and still have a hope. The Bible says that he has made us to sit together in heavenly places. You know what this scripture is telling us? This passage refers to how we can participate in the spiritual blessings and the power to come while still living in the present world that we sit in heavenly places you can sit in heavenly places in your pit you can sit in heavenly places in your prison you can sit in heavenly places in your sick bed in your discouragement know that you can sit you have access to a power That you're not going to die. You're going to live. You could claim that. And you can speak encouragement over your life. The scripture says also that he has made us future kings and priests. And that we are going to judge angels. Heavenly places. Kings, future kings and priests. Judging angels when we come back from being caught up with him. What this is telling us is our future position of judgment and power is predicated upon the completion of God's will. Joseph had to fight off every challenge that came his way, every stage that was pressing against him. He could have failed in Potiphar's house with his wife. He could have failed in the prison. He could have failed test after test but because he was obedient and he passed the test and he held on to his God it allowed him not to make it personal now he made personal the will of God but he didn't take personal the evil that was meant for him I'm going to ask that you would bow your head right where you're at Father, help us, Jesus. We feel like we've done something wrong. We feel like it's just our fault and there is no more hope. Condemnation has come from the enemy. Lord, and right now, I need encouragement. Right now, I need hope. Right now, I need to release the change of discouragement. I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. I'm worried about my son. I'm worried about my daughter, my husband, my wife. I'm, I'm worried. And I've taken it personal. But God, I'm going to take up your cross and I'm going to give it to you, Jesus. The scripture says to cast all our cares upon you, for you care for us. Lord, my worry, I'm going to cast it on you. My anxiety, I'm going to cast it on you. My sickness, I'm going to cast it on you. The worry that something else is going to be popping up in our lives that is harmful. Worry for our children, I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to take it personal. When the enemy has spoken in my ear and told me how much of a failure I was, it wasn't you. Your word your word tells me, Father, that there's favor upon my life. And nobody can take that away from me. And the more that the enemy tries to take it, 
you're going to step in for the good. But I just have to see you and I have to trust you. And I have to believe that I'm not going to take the evil person off. I'm not going to take the failure person off. My mess ups, I'm not going to take it personal. But today will be a new day where I repent and I ask you, Father, to heal me and strengthen me and deliver me and touch me. Because in the midst of this, Father, I need to see you. I need to see your favor again. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and meditate upon the word of God right now. Let him speak to you. Lord, is our altar call is filled with a 